Welcome wrestling fans worldwide to Knoxville and the Great Smoky Mountains for the Ron Fuller Tennessee Studcast. Six feet nine inches tall, 265 pounds. This historic podcast from one of the most respected and successful wrestlers and promoters will follow the footsteps of one of the largest and oldest wrestling families on the planet. The Tennessee Stud, Ron Fuller. Through 93 years and four generations. The Stud has arrived. Old school or new fan, this unique broadcast will educate and captivate as Ron details decades of professional wrestling's growth with truly unforgettable stories. I want those people out there at home to hear the stud. Sit back and enjoy the ride with the Tennessee stud. The Tennessee stud. You will learn that name. You will remember it. And now, the stud is here. Please welcome the creator of the popular 605 podcast and the president of the Arcadian Vanguard Podcast Network, your co-host, the great Ryan Last. Hello again, friends, and welcome back to another edition of Ron Fuller's Studcast. I'm the great Ryan Last, and it's my pleasure to be with you once again as the Tennessee Stud takes us down that road of wrestling history, sharing his personal tales and anecdotes with us each and every week. But without any further ado, I want to get to the Tennessee Stud because last week on the show, it was a little bit of a different episode. It was out of sequence because, as we mentioned briefly, and I didn't want to say too much, Ron's mother had a fall. So Tennessee Stud, Ron Fuller, obviously on the line. Ron, what can you tell us about what's going on? And first of all, how are you doing this week? Well, I'm doing great. Thank you very much. And uh, and my my mom, uh, I want to thank uh, all the fans, my gosh, the tremendous uh comments and the prayers and everything that have come in for her and and she's she's doing well i mean she she made it through her first surgery and uh it's uh it's just one of those tough things in life that we all deal with and uh she's she's tough and uh and i i look for her to to have success before it's all over uh and i'd like to apologize for missing the first stud cast i uh, that i have missed uh We've been rolling along at a pretty steady pace, and I apologize to fans out there. And hopefully, Brian, we're going to make up for it today because this one, I think, is going to be a really good one. Certainly is. I think it's going to be a championship quality episode this week, and I guess I'm teasing several things there as I say that. But before we get going with it, Ron, one last thing I want to mention here, Super Studcast number 15, where the Tennessee stud looks at his 10 most memorable matches. Part one is up now. Part two will be going up very soon for patrons of the Studcast at tnstud.com or patreon.com slash studcast for only $2.99, the best deal in wrestling. Check that out now, but we'll tell you a little bit more about the Super Studcast later in the show. Ron, let's pick up where we left off a couple weeks back. You're in Knoxville. You bought out John Kazana. What exactly was going on and what is going on as we begin this week? Well, obviously, uh, we're a process here. We're probably about uh, three months in as an owner of a new wrestling company. And we have scheduled, uh, we have known, or I knew uh, six weeks ahead uh, when I was going to get the world champion. I've already joined the NWA, and I've asked for a championship date. Uh, I guess I got a little pull there with Sam Muchnick because of all those years I spent wrestling for him in St. Louis. And he he throws me a date pretty quickly. So uh, we're going to start out with the, the, the Knoxville Coliseum, uh, the first big night. I consider this the first big night of mine as a new wrestling promoter. And uh, we've already spoken about the Knoxville Coliseum as being one of the main reasons I was interested in buying buying out John Kazana. And it's by far the largest public building in Knoxville, and it's about eight times larger than the building Kazana had been running its matches in when I bought him out, which is Joe Howie Park. Uh, And because of the size of his crowds, the Coliseum was just much too large and expensive for for John. And uh, so he made a a choice uh, not to try the Coliseum, and and I'm not absolutely sure, Brian, that he didn't maybe try it a time or two, but obviously he was never able to establish himself there. 
so I knew that if I, I could get big enough to afford the Coliseum on a weekly basis, that I could make that $150,000 sales price that everybody's been laughing at me about uh, start to look great. Uh, so that's precisely why I wanted to, to pin the $1,000 bill on Dale Lewis's uh, suit every week on television and, and to find some of the best wrestlers to work for me that could really wrestle and attract new fans. Uh, and obviously, in order to make that happen, I needed to convince people that wrestling was something for all fans and not just that blood and guts group that uh, that have, were watching the program each week and coming down to Chihuahua Park to support John Kazana. Uh, and I use that term, uh, I guess, you know, I never really cared much for that style of wrestling, but John was kind of handicapped by the fact that he didn't get the greatest wrestlers. Nick and Roy didn't have a lot of the greatest wrestlers that they could send him. And the ones that he could depend on were the Wright brothers. Uh, and they didn't have a tremendous amount of wrestling skills. Their style was different. So uh, I'm wanting to get away from a lot of that style. And I'm really wanting to get wrestling established and make uh, the word on the marquee wrestling mean something. And uh, so the fans know that this is the place to go if you want to see some darn good wrestling. So the day I closed to buy my company, as I said before, I didn't wait. I joined the NWA that day. I got in touch with Sam Mutz. He said, I'd like to become a member of the NWA. What I do, he sent me the proper paperwork. I took care of things. And uh, then I said, uh, is Sam, uh, uh, when can I get the champion? Uh, so, you know, uh, and I, the NWA champion, to me, in my opinion, was the best champion of any in the world. And and that had been f since Thez, at least, and maybe back beyond Thez. Uh, when they established the NWA, they chose Lou Thez. Uh, I, there was no wrestler during Lou's time frame that I can think of that had more credibility, uh, was more of a shooter background, that actually had all that wrestling knowledge that it takes to be a great world champion. So I wanted the NWA's world champion. That's why I joined the NWA. And it came a lot from my father and Eddie Graham and the influence I had growing up. It was easier for me, for me to join and, uh, and quick uh, to get the champion. And probably not just because of my relationship with Sam, but because of my relationship with Eddie, uh, my grandfather Roy, all the years he spent around Sam, uh, my father, Buddy Fuller, uh, Jim Barnett, the Funks, and many, many more members of the NWA that could vouch for me. And, you know, it wasn't a, a situation where this is a guy that's never been heard of. Uh, when I made the application, I'm sure when it got out to everybody, uh, they said, oh, yeah, we know this guy. And he's been around since he was a kid. And, uh, you know, probably a lot of them said, I can't believe he owns a company, you know, <laughs> but uh, so anyway, I got the champion and I got my first date for the NWA champion. And it happened to be on a on Friday night, which I needed. I wanted a Friday night, January 24th, 1975. Uh, I had about one month, maybe six weeks ahead to plan for this first world championship match ever in the Knoxville Coliseum. Uh, I had learned enough already how to build for a world championship match and uh, how to draw a large crowd in the week preceding it, which is an important deal. You want to go into a world championship match with great momentum because you're going to have a big night and you also want to come out of a world championship match with great momentum. And that's even more difficult, but we'll get to that later as the program goes on. Uh, I was going to do whatever to get this done and to get myself a large crowd in the week preceding it. And I went back to something that I learned uh, during my time in Florida, these one night tournaments that sometimes you don't have an obvious challenger. And in that case, you book these one night tournaments and there's several reasons for that. But, uh, so I booked a one night tournament and it was exactly what I needed uh, since I had no one over enough at that point to really draw a crowd. Or I didn't feel like I had anybody over enough that I wanted to put with uh, Jack Briscoe, who was the world champion. A lot of the listeners, Ron, are probably hearing that and saying, what about Ron Wright? Because obviously he was there when you purchased the town 
and he was a big part of your company at this period of time. Why not Ron Wright? Well, that's a darn good question, uh, you know, and and I gave it a lot of thought. I mean, Ron Wright had probably wrestled uh, with the world champions before there in Knoxville. But, you know, it goes back to, to, to my trying to educate fans in, in, to wrestling, and it goes back to that word wrestling. And Ron uh, is a he's a blood and guts guy, that's for sure. But he's not he didn't have the greatest skills as a wrestler. Jack Briscoe is a wrestling machine. Uh, so, you know, you have opportunity if you put the right guy with Jack Briscoe to just have an unbelievable wrestling match. And that's what I wanted. So so on Friday, January 17th, 1975, one week before Jack Briscoe is set to defend the title in the Coliseum. Uh, I have a one-night tournament booked, and, uh, and the winner of this tournament is going to wrestle Jack Briscoe. Uh, and I, let's just go ahead. We'll jump right into it, Brian. Uh, let me give you the card for that uh, January 17, 1975 show. It's in Chilhowee Park. It is not in the Coliseum, and it is exactly seven days before the world title match in the Coliseum. And I decide not to do what... I, what I really spent a lot of time struggling with, uh, having everybody involved in this one night tournament, I uh, just didn't feel like the the town was ready for that, and that uh, so I, I put only six guys in the tournament, uh, and the six guys in that tournament were Jerry Lawler, Nelson Royal, Dutch Mantell, Ron Wright, John Foley, and Florento Flores. And in the first round of the tournament, uh, Nelson Royal is going going to go against uh, Dutch Mantell. Good match. I mean, uh, obviously, uh, Dutch can wrestle, and uh, Nelson Royal can really wrestle. Uh, Ron Wright goes out, and and in that match, Dutch is going to beat. I mean, uh, Nelson Royal is going to beat Dutch. Ron Wright's going to go out and beat John Foley, and Jerry Lawler in that first round is going to beat Florento Flores. Uh, in the semifinals, Jerry Lawler is uh, going to have a pretty decent match with Ron Wright, uh, but it's kind of a, a more of a brawling affair, uh, kind of up Ron Wright's alley. And uh, that's not, uh, I get to see there that, that uh, you know, th- that he's not going to be the guy, and that, that works out well. Jerry Lawler wins that match. Uh, Nelson Royal is going to receive a bye. Uh, right straight into the finals, which is the next round. There's only six guys in it. And in the finals, Nelson Royal has a great match with Jerry Lawler. Jerry Lawler is a fabulous talent who is able to wrestle when he needed to and to do the blood and guts thing when he had to. And uh, they have a tremendous match. And Nelson Royal wins the tournament to face Jack Briscoe the following week. And uh, the remaining matches on the card that night, Dale Lewis, he's doing the $1,000 challenge every night now. He beats a guy named Larry Bennett, and he does a handicap match. He, and he did quite a few of these because he's just so much better than most wrestlers that it's ridiculous to put Dale Lewis against an unknown or even a fairly decent wrestler by themselves. Uh, so I would put him against two guys uh, in a handicap match, and he beats both Larry Bennett and Steve Husky in a handicap match. And then he defeats three $1,000 challengers back to back to back, and he does it without leaving the ring. He beats the two guys. They announce that, uh, you know, they announce early in the evenings for these $1,000 challenges. We don't wait until we get down to match time. They announce at the beginning of the night until he comes to the ring, till Dale comes to the ring, you can sign up for your opportunity to wrestle uh, for this $1,000 challenge. So when he finishes his match, they bring up the three challengers. They stand at ringside, and Dale, as usual, just uh, really does a tremendous job with taking care of them, not hurting them, uh, but really in an impressive way, this beats them. And, and people just are like, wow, you know, this this guy really can wrestle. I mean, you know, he, he's doing some really fantastic stuff. Uh, so 
that's really where I want to be. It's it's building toward that name on the marquee, and uh, Dale was the perfect guy to do it. Next match, pretty darn decent guy right here too. Danny Hodge is going to beat Jim Kent. You, know, you talk about a wrestler. My gosh, I'm trying to put wrestlers on these cards. I want people to see guys really that can do it and uh, and and not just be there and not enjoying the match, but be there and on the edge of their seat and and leave and when leave the building when the match is over, talking about the wrestling match, not the blood and guts match. And uh, so Danny gives me that every time I ever put him on my cards. And Danny, I'm going to use quite a bit here in the early years because he's just such a phenomenal wrestler and and he's so good for the sport. He's a great ambassador for the sport. Uh, Les Thatcher beats Tony Peters. Tony Peters is a fairly large guy, much bigger than Les. But Les is doing a lot of wrestling, too. He has all the skills. And uh, they have a pretty decent match, and Les wins. Uh, I book a ladies' match. Uh, Vicki Williams is going to r- beat Paula Kay. And the point in that match is that next week, uh, the fabulous Moolah, world heavyweight, the world's ladies' heavyweight champion, is going to wrestle the winner of this girls' match a week earlier. And Vicki Williams wins that match. This was one of the largest crowds yet for me in Chihuahua Park. Uh, I think a lot of that was due to the one-night tournament. Tournaments add more matches to your card, and fans just love more matches. If they see you've got 10 matches on a card or 12 matches on a card, uh, they're going to go, wow, you know, this is special. They they, they want to go to that type of an event. Uh, this tournament only had six wrestlers in the tournament itself, but that ended up being five total matches. And with the other four, you end up with nine matches on this card, which is a pretty good deal for the fans. And it keeps your momentum going. We got a little momentum going here, and we're trying to really build momentum for the next week in the Coliseum. Uh, You know, and and these one-night tournaments, as an example, I've been in one-night tournaments in which you've got 14, 16 wrestlers. If you've got 16 wrestlers in a tournament, you're going to have 15 matches before that tournament is over. And that gives fan a, a just a phenomenal night of action. They they can't, they hard they have a hard time ever seeing that many matches without it being a tournament. So this show, like I said, had nine total matches with only thirteen wrestlers. Now that thirteen wrestlers is an important figure because it makes the payoff larger because of the smaller number of guys to pay. Uh, so have a pretty decent house that night. It's it's up there pretty close to full. And uh, I'm able to pay guys a pretty good payoff. And so, you know, once the guys get that larger payoff that night, they're already looking ahead at next week. They know the champion is coming next week. And they're looking at that payoff and going, wow, you know, uh, what do you think I'm going to make next Friday night? Uh, because it's a world title night. You know, I mean, uh, they, we're going to have a big crowd. We're going to be in the Coliseum. Uh, their wrestler's anticipation of growth in crowd sizes, it gets them fired up because that's going to lead to bigger payoffs. And I wanted the business to start with an upward curve at the box office. It had started so slowly. I'm trying to get some momentum started for the future. And uh, I want to get that upward curve. I want that uh, chart to show that line that's headed up to the top there. Uh, and, I, and I want that upward curve to re- to represent the box office sales, obviously. And, uh, and that's going to give guys more confidence in me uh, that maybe I know what I'm doing since I'm only 26 years old. They're looking at me like, you know, this guy's just a kid. You know, uh, he's he's he's. I'm one of the youngest guys in the dressing room, and I own the company. So, uh, so some are now living there, and, and you know, like um, like Dale Lewis is living there, uh, uh, Mantell is living there, Foley is living there, and their families are living there. You know, and, the, and they have basically uh, put their confidence in me. And they're they're invested. They've invested themselves and their family in my ability as a promoter and a booker. It puts a lot of pressure on a young guy 
like I am at that age, who's old. I'm, I'm, I'm not even old enough even to be a top star in most territories, much less the owner of a territory. Ron, when you run a weekly city and all of a sudden you're getting ready to go to a bigger building for a bigger event, something that's a, a you know, look, you have the world championship and the world's women championship. That's a big deal. How much thought goes into the scheduling? Do you stick with your weekly event the week before? Do you skip a week trying to build up anticipation? How do you bounce back after the big event? How much thought goes into the scheduling and how not to have a negative effect on your regular crowds going to the new building? That's a great question, too. I mean, and, and it's a critical question, actually, you know, uh, you, you want to have momentum going into the world championship match, uh, but your biggest fear is a crash after the world championship match. And, uh, you know, uh, I'm going to save that for the end of the show here, Brian. Uh, you know, I, okay. I, I have, I, at this point, uh, I, I know I got the champion. I know I have to follow the champion. Uh, I'm doing my homework. I, I've, I'm, I'm going to become a pretty decent promoter because I have realized all these things. And I know the importance of uh, what you're talking about and how important it is to maintain that momentum. Uh, so, uh, you know, actually, the real action, it, 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 it maybe is the best card ever in Knoxville that is going to come next week in that Civic Coliseum. Uh, and, and I truly believe it probably is undoubtedly the best card that has ever been in Knoxville. And I know it's the best card that's ever been in the Civic Coliseum. And uh, so before we get to that card, I, can we talk a little bit, Brian, about something? I want to take us in a little different direction today. I feel like that fans are out there. And what I do is kind of talk history and, and I talk about how business works and the, back in those days and what you had to do and what made it happen and what caused it not to happen sometimes. And so I want to talk a little bit before we get to that Coliseum show about advertising and then what else it takes to draw the big crowds and uh, and how important it is to inspire the wrestlers before an event like this big upcoming world championship. Uh, I think uh, fans would enjoy the fact that you know, people say I'm a I'm a wrestling historian, uh, you know, and it's because I had the opportunity, the rare opportunity to be wrestler, booker and owner uh, before by 26 years of age. And it gave me such a long career as being in that spot and uh, and being able to to learn these things. And uh, I think uh, fans would enjoy the fact uh, that. Of how we do. And let's start just with the advertising. Okay. And uh, my father was one of the very best at creating and utilizing different types of publicity to make his wrestling territory successful. Uh, I look back on it. I've, I saw, I've seen Florida, this operation at this point. I have seen Georgia's operation at this point. I have never and in, in, in other places I ever went, I never went anywhere in all of wrestling in all of my career and saw anybody do a better job at advertising than my dad did. He just realized that if you've got a good product and nobody knows about it, you're never going to make it. It's just not going to happen for you. So what he did is he left no stone unturned uh, to reach every potential fan out there. And he did it by running newspaper ads. He put out wrestling posters every week. He ran billboards. He put signs on taxis, buses, even signs on the bus benches. And uh, most importantly, he had a television program each week that was critical to making it happen. But when you take that television audience that's built in for you and it's producing a tremendous audience there that watch you on TV, that's a great portion of what you need. But when you throw in all these other elements, the newspapers, the wrestling posters, the billboards, the taxis, the buses, uh, it's just, it's a killer, killer way to advertise. And you just can't fail. It's like a, he's like covering his butt to make sure that I don't fail here. Uh, so he'd have all these elements going at once and and lots of times for long periods of time it would just be you would see these signs on those buses for 
last uh, two, three years. And, uh, and just everything was pushed and the advertising became the most important part of his business, I believe. I think that had a lot to do with him drawing those four of the biggest crowds ever in the history of four different states uh, because he just pushed it and advertised it to death. And, and he had a great advertising program because he had a catchphrase. He didn't just try to go and you can't put a whole lot of big signage on the back of a bus or on the top of a taxi cab. You can just about only have one phrase up there that's got to say it all. And my dad's phrase was that he used starting in Mobile in the early 1950s all the way through into Georgia in the 1960s and 70s was wrestling king of sports. Uh, That's all he put uh, most of the time, that was it, wrestling king of sports. If he had the bigger billboard opportunity, he would maybe put his television time because that's his second biggest way for him to advertise or the biggest way for him to advertise. And so he gets you watching that TV. He's going to get you in that house sooner or later. Uh, so it not only built the interest in the, in the new sport uh, to many, and then like when he came to Memphis, it was in such horrible shape. It was like a new sport. Uh, a lot of people didn't know about it. And if they did, they certainly didn't care about it. But like I said, he set those unbroken records for attendance. And, and he maintained the sports popularity for years following his departure. Uh, Memphis is a perfect example. Memphis, once Dad left there, it, it just was always a fabulous wrestling city. And it's because of his advertising. What kind of advertising did you do, Ron, leading into this big event, your first event in the Coliseum? Well, for the first one, I ran, obviously, a newspaper ad, but I ran the ad twice. I ran it on Sunday prior to the Friday night. Uh, Biggest paper, uh, biggest circulation, uh, opportunity to reach more people. And then I ran it again Friday, the day of the event. Uh, I pulled out... uh, I put out wrestling posters, as as many as 300 in the Knoxville area alone. And I had Mac, who was my guy that put me in business there, basically, uh, putting out posters in most every smaller city within 30 miles of Knoxville. We probably put out as many as uh, 800 to 1,000 posters in the Knoxville area for this one card. And posters were not used there by Kazana. So they had an impact. Uh, people hadn't seen them before. If they'd seen them all the time, they quit reading them. But if they're not there, I, I knew we had to go with posters on a big event like this. Uh, I ran billboards, uh, and I had to start immediately. As soon as I got the okay from Sam, I went to a billboard company, and, and I ran billboard ads uh, one month in advance, promoting the date. You have enough room on a billboard, and these are not the freeway fit billboards. These are regular size billboards, but it's a big, it's a big board, and you obviously got enough room to promote your date and the fact you're going to be in the Coliseum. I mean, that's so vital here. This is not a world championship event in Chill Alley Park that the building isn't going to hold, but 1,200, 1,400 people. This one is in the Coliseum. Uh, and uh, and you put a big wrestling shot of some kind, a suplex or a body slam or something like that. They grain people's attention so that they look at it because they see that wrestling action there. And then they've got enough time. You don't overdo a billboard. You lose the effect if there's too much writing there. But they quickly see the date. They quickly see it's a coliseum. And they know by the photo it's wrestling. Uh, you've sold them. Uh, if you're going to get them, you, you've got your opportunity right there. Uh, obviously, I had the television show. But at that point, I was very far from being proud of the television show, to be honest with you. I didn't. I took no chances. I, I kind of took my dad's approach here. I took no chances uh, that I would fail here with this big event. And I went went pretty pretty strong for the advertising on it, billboards especially. Uh, and it's the most expensive of what we've talked about here, those billboards. But I found them to be the mo- one of the most effective things you can do to advertise wrestling, oddly enough, in the long run. 
and uh, they boost credibility. Uh, people see a billboard and uh, they see wrestling on that billboard. It's about the last thing they expect to see on a billboard. So it makes you look uh, look uh, big time. And it also reaches a great number of people. And that's the whole point here. I, I want to really get uh, everybody to see that this is in the Coliseum and this is a big time deal. So uh, I would find in the course of my wrestling promotions, billboards would have probably the greatest impact other than your television. Uh, my experience with billboards proved to me that they're worth as an advertising medium. I mean, you know, they're just phenomenal. Uh, the company I dealt with was called Lamar, and they were one of the largest billboard companies in the South back in that time frame. Uh, in fact, I ran advertising schedules with them throughout all my days with Southeastern in Knoxville. And when I went to Pensacola, I did the same thing in that territory as well. Uh, my advertising with those two southeastern companies covered as many as 20 cities in the south at one time. I would do billboard programs that would be running in 20 cities uh, from Knoxville south to the Gulf Coast. And then this, this my love for billboards, I began to just really appreciate the, the, the uh, simplicity and the, and the effect of it. Uh, that it led to a major buy in Nashville uh, with my first hockey team when I started there in 1989. And except there, I decided to up it a notch and go from the regular billboards to the huge freeway billboards. But either way, wrestling or hockey, I don't care what the sport is, it really is going to have the impact if you get billboards. Ron, let's get back to this first show that you're building up at the Coliseum in Knoxville. You talked about the importance of keeping the momentum going with the fans, with everything that you're doing. What about with the actual wrestlers? How do you keep them in the right frame of mind? Well, let's 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 uh, let's talk about it then. Uh, you know, wrestlers are getting in, in now. I've got to sit them down and talk to them, uh, I, and I think yeah, I don't have to, but you know, I'm an owner here, and I'm kind of like a coach in a way. You know, this is my team. And you've got to inspire your team on certain occasions. And uh, this is a great occasion in which to get your team ready. So uh, so I want to get the wrestlers in the right frame of mind, right? Uh, and they've been working their butts off uh, to get ready for this anyway, uh, for this first Coliseum show. And I have told them about it three weeks ahead of time. They know it's upcoming. I want them to know that I'm not just going to sit here and let us try to build this town without doing something big and something special to give us a jump start and to get us going. So I had a meeting with everyone, including the referees, on the Friday night before the show. That's this show that we talked about earlier in which we had the uh, tournament, the one-night tournament. And uh, so I talked about talked to them about what I wanted to accomplish, what my goals were uh, when I bought Knoxville. And I talked to them about how I wanted to create a territory where guys could work six nights a week and make a thousand or more weekly and live in one of the most beautiful parts of our country. Uh, I, I wanted them to know that I, I was just not focused on Knoxville, that there's so much here that's never been touched. And I, I intend to get to it. I intend to touch this country side around Knoxville and on up into Johnson City and the Tri-Cities, on up into West Virginia. I plan to grow uh, my company into being more than just you come to work in Knoxville and that's all you're going to get. I want to get to that six nights a week. I want to get to that $1,000 payoffs every week uh, back in the 70s, early 70s. That's some pretty decent money. Uh, we talked about how important this night in the Coliseum was going to be toward making that territory happen. This was, to me, the first step to making putting Knoxville on the map. Uh, I wanted people to, uh, to get involved and get really, really uh, enthused about this new wrestling that they had. It's a company name. It's not John Kazana and Wide World of Sports anymore. It's Southeastern Championship Wrestling. And I wanted to really get people talking about that. Uh, and uh, we talked about creating respect, that respect from everyone that, that recognizes us on the street, fans or not. 
And that's what happens when you start really getting a wrestling company rolling. Uh, I went into Knoxville. They didn't know who I was. Uh, and I went out with other wrestlers that had been there, and they didn't know who they were. And that was that was odd for me because I'd come from Florida. And Florida had such respect, and they had people were watching that television program, and you were recognized everywhere you went. And I wanted these guys, I talked to these guys about, we're trying to create that respect from everyone that recognizes us on the streets, whether they're fans or not. And I wanted to impress upon them how important that respect was in building a solid business and how great it was to feel that respect when you dealt with people. When you went into a store and somebody says to you, oh, are you Ron Fuller? And I and you say yes, uh, and they want to have a conversation with you. You can see their enthusiasm. That's a wonderful thing. It doesn't happen in every territory. Uh, I doubt it was happening in Nashville, to be honest with you, but because Roy and Nick didn't publicize the same. They didn't have that type of wrestling a lot of times. I don't know that they got it to that level. It's not there in Knoxville at this point either, but it will be there. There will come a time down the road in Knoxville when you won't be able to go outside your door without people knowing who you are. It got so big for me uh and by 1977, uh, 78, I couldn't go to the fair. I could not go to big outside events because I was inundated. I could not walk. Uh, crowds would follow you. Uh, but that's what I wanted. That's what we needed. Uh, we talked about, and I say we, because it wasn't just me doing the talking. I wanted them to get involved. I wanted them to become a part of this. Uh, it, I don't want them to feel like they're not a part of it uh, because they are such an integral part of it. So we talked about the effort and doing more than was usual with this larger crowd we were expecting because those people out there, a lot of them are going to be first timers that they've never gone to a live event. They may have been watching the show for a long time, but this is the type of an event that puts them asses in the seats. It, it, it makes people come. And how I talked to them about how I believe that the first impressions are, are truly everything for any sports fan attending their first sports event. I honestly believe that you can, you can make yourself in that first big night or you can murder yourself in that first big night. And, and it didn't just happen in wrestling. I felt the same way in hockey. And I think that's why we had such great success with hockey is because we made that tremendous first impression. And uh, this is our opportunity this big world championship match, it is our opportunity to make that lasting impression that's going to make some of those fans fans forever. It's that important. We will return in just one moment and hear more about the first great Knoxville Coliseum card that the Tennessee Stud ran. But first, a word about the latest Super Stud cast, Super Stud cast number 15, Ron's 10 Most Memorable Matches. The Stud has released Super Studcast number 15 at TNStud.com or Patreon.com slash Studcast. The Stud entertains us on rides of all kinds in different directions with each Super Studcast. Number 15 is no exception. With an entirely new topic, it's sure to be a wild and wonderful three hours into the top 10 most memorable matches from his fabulous career. One match with maybe the toughest wrestler of all time. A six-man tag versus the best Aussies in the world. Two riots that include one in which he is cut by a fan. A match that jumpstarts his greatest year in the sport. A tag match with an out-of-this-world finish. A triumphant return to a lost territory. One world champion in a Texas death match. And two others in phenomenal NWA world title matches. No wonder Super Studcast are now one of the most popular podcasts on the internet. Saddle up for this mind-blowing experience at tnstud.com or patreon.com slash studcast for only $2.99. There you hear it, Super Studcast number 15, Ron's 10 most memorable matches. Part one is up now for all patrons of the show at both tnstud.com and patreon.com slash studcast. 
Thank you to all the new people that have jumped aboard and been checking out the past Super Stud Cast and rest of the stories. We really appreciate it, and we have some really, really cool things in store for you in the weeks and months ahead that we think everyone will get a kick out of. But Ron, let's go back to the story. Let's go back to the beginning of 1975. You're getting ready to do your first show at the Knoxville Coliseum. You talked about the meeting you had in the locker room, getting everyone ready for the show. Was that something common in wrestling? Did you see that ever in Florida? Did you see that ever in Georgia? A group meeting, a team meeting, a locker room meeting led by their office? Never. <laughs> I'd never seen it before. Uh, I just felt like, uh, you know, I was really lucky, Brian. Uh, I got rid of uh, my granddad's uh, 10% uh, talent agreement and ended up having to get them on my own. And I felt so lucky to have talked to Mantell and Foley and and Dale Lewis into moving into town and living there. Uh, I, I wanted him to know uh, this, the importance, how important it was to me. Uh, I don't know. For whatever reason, I, I just felt like this was necessary to do it uh, prior to the match uh, the following week uh, to get them all fired up uh, and to maybe it would somehow translate uh, to the fans out there who are watching those matches, how hard these guys are working. And, and I think they accomplished that for me, which uh, I really believe that that did happen for me. Wasn't a mistake. I don't believe uh, for sure, but I had never seen anyone do that before. You've mentioned some of the people that you wanted there, the NWA champion, Fabulous Moolah, the world's women's champion. But how do you decide who and what exactly you want on this card? Well, that, that's a great question, too. I mean, uh, you know, as I said many times before, I, I know I want to educate fans to, to great wrestling. And I want to change the culture in Knoxville from blood and guts wrestling as, as it always been for many years. Uh, I knew who I wanted, but it was hard getting who I wanted. Uh, you know, I, I was limited in my choices because I didn't have the reputation of success at this point needed to attract that kind of talent yet. Uh, so, you know, I got to I got to show people uh, in the wrestling business, uh, especially the boys that, hey, this guy can run a great company. He, he can make me money. And I hadn't had that opportunity, so I would have had a different card probably, but I'm limited here because I, I need to have success before I can create success, and that's pretty hard to do, but uh, that's exactly where I am at this point. Uh, I decided if I want lots of great wrestling matches, uh, I need to look south. <laughs> I need to look at look to my friends and family and where else am I going to look? But down there in Florida, where the best wrestling in the country is. Uh, so I, I get on the phone and I call my dad and, uh, you know, and then he, he, he's, he's off for trying to help me. And he says, call Eddie. And then I have a long conversation with Eddie. And, and, uh, after Eddie says, you know, we're going to try to help you here, you know, uh, and then I ask Eddie, is it okay if I talk with Watts, <laughs> you know, and Watts is their booker and, uh, Bill's Bill's just like them. He's all in, uh, you know, I had a lot of friends. I had a lot of great connections and, uh, and, and I used all of them on this one. I, I, I just, so, you know, and, uh, you know, Watts is, you know, asked me like, you know, what do you want? You know, I, and I, and I said, you know, I, I want to, I told him what I wanted to accomplish in my first Coliseum show. Uh, and he, he said, well, what do you want? And I said, I want wrestling, 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 you know, and, uh, and they couldn't have been more accommodating to me. Uh, they sacrificed their own profits by providing me with five of their best workers uh, on a Friday night when they had two cities running in Florida, they had Tallahassee in the northern part of the state and Fort Lauderdale in the southern part of the state. And to take five talented guys that they sent me uh, and send them up there is just, uh, you know, that was, in my opinion, the total commitment to my success. And it made me love and appreciate Eddie Graham and my father more than ever because they recognized that, that I needed help. They recognized what type of help to send me, and uh, and they they showed me that they wanted me to be a be a success. And uh, 
that's a at a time like that when I'm suffering, I, I'm 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 barely making it go, and I I'm having a hard time paying my talent and all that stuff. So it's difficult for me during this time frame. And these guys, I mean, that commitment they made to me was just absolutely unbelievable. So you mentioned that they made a commitment to help you out. What wrestlers were there? What wrestlers did they commit, or did they commit themselves to helping you out in Knoxville that night? Okay. Well, you know, I'm saying there were five, uh, this first thing, we're going to start at the top with the, with the main event. Uh, and, uh, that's the NWA world heavyweight championship. And, uh, Jack Briscoe is the champion. Now I'm saying that they sent Jack at this point, Jack is everybody's champion within the NWA. Uh, he's not a talent that's just live this just uh go, working every week in florida like he had for many many years now he is everybody's talent but he still lives down there in tampa so i'm considering him the fifth guy and uh since nelson royal won the tournament uh i couldn't have had a better guy wow i wanted wrestling i wanted the the right guy to wrestle jack briscoe i wanted those fans to have their first opportunity ever to see a great wrestling match and those guys went out there and did a 60 minute draw match that just stood them up a wrestling match that stood them up a wrestling match that had nothing more than not a single punch just forearms. When they wanted to get heat, it was with the forearm. Uh, it was absolutely perfect. It was exactly what I wanted those fans to see. Uh, it was a great, great match. Well, from there, obviously, that was the main event, the NWA World Championship. The NWA World Championship match. What other matches were on the show? Okay, uh, I wrestled against uh, Cowboy Bill Watts. Another Great wrestling match. Uh, you know, when I had left Florida, not too much earlier than that, six or eight months earlier, uh, Watts and I were in, in, and I was a baby face and he was a heel and he had turned on me. And, and we had a lot of matches that had a little blood and gut stuff to it. Uh, but this one was a wrestling match. We went out there and really had a great wrestling match. We, tried to be a great buildup and a lead in to that world championship match that's coming after us. And I was really, really pleased with the results of that one as well. Uh, obviously, uh, uh, Bill puts me over and, uh, and th that gives me a quality win. And as a heel in front of all those new fans, they get to see me be one of the best wrestlers in the country and uh, it, 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 it had to help me in that respect. Um, the next match was uh, Ron Wright against Don Kent. Uh, it was a no DQ match. Uh, this is your blood and guts match. For all those normal fans that come to Chill Howie Park, this is their reason to come to the Coliseum is because they know this is a no DQ match. They know that Ron Wright's going to have his chisel out you know, he's going to work on Don Kent probably. And uh, this is going to be a a different match than everything else on the card. And I, I, I wanted that. I needed that. It's a perfect match because I got to give my normal fans that have been coming for years uh, their match. And that I considered to be their match. Uh, quite honestly, the rest of the matches on this card I consider to be new fans matches, people that have not had a lot of wrestling matches under their belt and um, have an impression of what's going on. Next match is Mike and Eddie Graham. They, like you said, they sent me the top, <laughs> you know, Eddie himself comes down and brings Mike, uh, they wrestle against Dutch Mantel and John Foley. A fabulous, fabulous match. Uh, Eddie and Mike were a phenomenal team. Mike is really young at this time frame. Uh, looks like he's 18 years old it, and, uh, Eddie is that, oh, that killer, uh, great wrestler down, does all kinds of wrestling moves, but then Mike goes out and gets that tremendous heat and makes that hot tag to Eddie. And there ain't much more fire than Eddie Graham. I mean, he just, he just, wow. Roof comes off the building in this match. Uh, people have never seen Mike or Eddie Graham. 
Uh, I don't think a lot of them had ever seen them, period, on television or any place else. Uh, and uh, Bill Watts is a little bit that same situation. You know, the, not a lot of people know him in Knoxville. They've only seen their regional television program. And Watts has never worked there. Neither has Jack Briscoe. Now Mike and Eddie Graham. But I'll tell you, at the end of this match, those two guys, Mike and Eddie Graham, could have come back the next week and uh, and drawn a big crowd uh, against any tag team combination. Really, really got themselves over and really gave these wrestling fans a chance to see somebody that could do it in a different way. And that was the whole concept of trying to get the right matches. Such a crucial factor in this world championship night. Next one is the world's ladies championship. Fabulous Moolah against Vicky Williams. Obviously, the fabulous Moolah is going to win. Uh, I, I love Moolah. Uh, I was not a big fan of lady wrestling, but I really loved Moolah because Moolah trained all of them. And Moolah trained her girls to shoot, uh, just like uh, wrestlers back in my day were trained to shoot. And she was wicked. I mean, uh, she hurt her girls. They, they, they were scared of Moolah. Uh, she had a hard time getting a match out of some of them, but she knew which ones were good. And I asked her when I booked this match, I said, uh, "Who? I need uh, somebody that's one of your better girls. And she sent me Williams and, and, and another girl the week before, and, and Williams went over the other girl because I wanted to put Williams against Moolah. Moolah says, I want to put work with Williams. She will give more to me than anybody else. And uh, Moolah goes out there and not only has a fantastic World's Ladies match on this night, but I'm going to book Moolah on a lot of triple world championship nights uh, and have her defend her ladies match because she wrestles. They wrestle. It's a wrestling match. It's right up the alley. I want to take everybody in a uh, uh, great match for a ladies match. I was thrilled with it. It was fantastic. Uh, one right before the ladies match, Danny Hodge against Let's Thatcher. Uh, Gosh, Marty, we're talking wrestling, man. We're talking a fabulous wrestling night. And these guys, I don't want Thatcher to lose. He's 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 helping me. Uh, and Hodge is so good and and so respected and admired by fans. Uh, That's a thirty minute draw. They wrestle thirty minutes, and the last match they wrestle an hour. And I mean, they wrestle in both of them. Pretty darn spectacular. Worked out fabulous for me. Uh, Dale Lewis, next match. Dale Lewis against Steve Kern, young kid out of Florida at this point. Going to become a great worker. Uh, this and Lewis and Steve Kern have a tremendous match. Lewis does a little bit of healing in it, but uh, it's still a tremendous wrestling match. Uh, Dale leads him, and uh, and Steve's such a good worker at this point. He's a young kid, but he's he's really on top of his game. He's going to be going to be a star in in uh, Florida. Uh, Lewis wins, obviously. And then uh, Dale wrestles back-to-back, -back, three more challengers. Uh, this, to me, is one of the most important parts of this card. It's that $1,000 challenge match, and they start at the beginning of the night. Say, ladies and gentlemen, if any of you are here for the $1,000 challenge and you want to sign up to wrestle Dale Lewis tonight for a chance at that $1,000, uh, come up to the box office up at the – for the front of the building so they go up to the box office at the front and uh they're right there uh signing up so dale wrestles kern kern leaves the ring dale gets on the microphone and says i'm ready <laughs> it's like he never wrestled off he goes i'm ready is there anybody here with the guts enough to line up and uh we bring three of them down they line up and he takes them in there and as another fantastic job. Just uh, sweetly rolls them around on the mat, uh, hooks them, uh, pins them, whatever is easy for him. And uh, it, it's just, it's fabulous. It's fabulous for what it's doing for these people that have never seen this type of thing before. And it's tremendous for the legitimacy of the sport because a lot of people are sitting home uh, and watching TV and go, 
Oh, that's a bunch of fake and phony stuff. I could beat that guy. I can beat that. I could beat Dale Lewis. But when they actually go and they see three fans have a go at him, they realize just how real wrestling is. And uh, that's my whole ball game. <laughs> that to me is the that's the great start to your evening right there. And it flows wrestling almost all the way through. Okay, Ron, so you recap the card. Talk about the results in terms of how was the attendance? Did it go as well as you hoped it would? Did it feel like the big night that you hoped it would? Talk about the actual results, not the wrestling results, but the results of promoting the event. For a promoter, this is your bottom line. You know, uh, and most promoters don't care about the matches. A lot of them don't care about the quality of the matches. But I'm I'm in I'm as much into that part of it as what the box office is going to produce. Uh, the attendance was around twenty five hundred. Uh, that's little less than half the building being full. Uh, uh, but it's a it's a little more than twice as much as what I drew the week before in Chill Howie Park. So. You know, it's a it's a gain. Uh, I was obviously hoping for more, but I realized it could have been even smaller. Uh, so that's that's how I had to view it. Uh, the fact that, you know, I wished it would better, but it, but it could have been worse. And, and I had to be very careful not to allow myself to be disappointed because that might show in my face to the guys that are working for me. And uh, and these guys are working their butts off to make the business better. So I I, I made a real strong point of uh, having a big smile and a big grin on my face all night long because I wanted guys to think that we are moving forward and that we're growing and we're going to get where we want to go. I thought that was extremely important that that happened for us. Uh, obviously, the payoff's bigger than the usual payoff uh, because the house – is double the money. Uh, so it's a, our first show in the Coliseum, and it does somewhere around $10,000. I think it was just below. It's in the high nines. Uh, I, I was hoping for 14, 12, 14, somewhere in there. But, uh, you know, the payoff is still good. And uh, and uh, the, But the problem for me as a promoter is, the, we're in a bigger building, so the so are the the playoff was bigger, and so was the expenses of the building, uh, a lot more than what they usually were. So the bottom line for me as a promoter is I probably made just about the same thing I made on the Friday before, which you know, be quite honest with you, as I remember Brian back in those days, uh, we're probably talking about uh, three hundred dollars, maybe you know, I mean, and we're not talking about a tremendous bunch of money going in my pocket. But, uh, you know, I started to look more than at, at what we had accomplished that night. Uh, we doubled the audience. I started seeing it from a different perspective. We doubled the audience. And more importantly, we added many people that had probably watched wrestling for years and never came because it was not in the Coliseum. We brought these new potential long-term fans out to see it uh and uh and they got to see exactly what i wanted them to see a great night of wrestling uh, and oddly enough i think there were a large number of usual fans that probably didn't come because we were in the coliseum those blood and guts fans they don't want to go to the coliseum it's too nice a building it's too big i can't get i can't see uh whatever the excuse may be but uh I was very willing to sacrifice those blood and guts fans to reach a much larger base that's going to allow me to build to a full-time future in this Coliseum where every week we don't wrestle in a small building in a dinky place. We're wrestling in the biggest building in the city. Uh, I was willing to give up some of the blood and guts fans to build Knoxville's future on real wrestling fans. Ron, we are tight on time, but let me ask you one question that I asked you earlier in the show, and you said that you may have an answer later on. How do you follow this card? If you're the promoter and you're building everything towards the big show, what do you do so you don't lose that entire crowd the next week? Well, as I said earlier, uh, I wasn't caught uh, flat-footed here. I wasn't caught uh, looking the wrong direction. I had, I knew the importance of drawing a big crowd and being able to follow it. 
So I'd given a great deal of thought about uh, that more than a month before the first Coliseum show. Uh, you know, when I started thinking about the first, I, I, I knew that a dramatic drop in the crowd after this huge show would could be a critical mistake. Uh, it could set us back rather than to move us forward. So I started planning for this show the same time I planned for the, the next show. The Coliseum show I planned for, and then I had to spend more time actually finding the right thing to do to follow this show. So uh, the next week, uh, I brought in the biggest wrestler and star of all time, and uh, he had never been to Knoxville before. Well, that's a heck of a tease there, but as we begin to wrap things up, I want to remind you, if you're on Facebook, become friends with the Tennessee Stud, the page Ron Fuller, the Tennessee Stud. Do that and you're automatically friends with a wrestling legend. You can follow the Tennessee Stud on Instagram and Twitter at Ron Fuller Welch. You can follow me on Twitter at Great Brian Last and you can hear me on the 605 Super Podcast at 605pod.com or available wherever it is that you find your favorite podcasts, classic wrestling talk, and wrestling humor, the 605 Super Podcast. Once again, we want to remind you, Super Studcast number 15 is following in the footsteps of the last two great Super Studcasts about the 1979 Knoxville Wrestling War. And of course, we had Dr. D. David Schultz on just recently. Number 15 covers the Stud's 10 most memorable matches of his career. Part one is up now. Part two is about to come out. Get them right now at tnstud.com or patreon.com slash studcast. Only $2.99 for three hours of additional content. And we heard from many of the patrons who have said, we want more stud. We are looking into it right now. We're looking at what other features we can currently give you so you get more great content from the Tennessee stud. But on that topic of great content from the stud, Ron, where are we going next week? Okay, well, next week, uh, we're right back here on the Studcast again, obviously, and uh, we're going to welcome one of my best friends ever in the sport and a bona fide superstar, uh, Andre the Giant's going to make his first ever Knoxville appearance. Uh, next week's Studcast is going to be filled with the big man's wrestling on that night and also some fabulous stories that I love telling that I've never told on the Studcast yet of how that big man shakes up a city after the bell rings to start the rest of his night. I mean, you know, once Andre finishes in the ring, Andre has a whole new agenda then because nighttime is something special with Andre. Wow, if you thought that earlier tease was good, that's how you do a tease right there. But we'll have more about that next week on the show. Ron Fuller's Studcast is a production of the Arcadian Vanguard Podcast Network. For the Tennessee Stud Ron Fuller, I'm the great Brian Last. The story continues next week.